Okay. Um, we'll get started. There are still a couple people um, coming online and we'll let them in as we go along. Uh, before we get started though, I just want to ask everybody um, please to uh, keep yourself muted so that everyone can hear and also to um, save on bandwidth because some people I know are calling in from places um, where the internet is, is a bit sketchy. Um, what we can do though is I want to be able to take questions and I would ask that if you can hold off on questions, hold off till the end. We'll have plenty of time to answer questions then. But if there's something that you really don't understand or need me to, to go over in more detail, um, in Zoom there is a feature where you can uh, raise your hand and I can, uh, or send it in a chat message, which I have open on my screen, and I can address uh, questions as they come up if there's something really that uh, needs to be addressed at that time. Um, so without uh, further ado then, um, just wanna thank you all for, for taking your time out of the day to uh, attend this webinar. It's the first one we've done, so please forgive any technical glitches or anything that we experience. Um, and what I'm gonna be talking about is uh, a new threat to uh, corals and coral reefs in the Bahamas um, called stony coral tissue loss disease. Uh, and probably uh, it's one of the most serious, if not the most serious threat right now to uh, coral reefs in the Caribbean where it's occurring. Um, I know many of you know me, but for those of you that don't, uh, my name's Craig Dahlgren. I'm the director of the Perry Institute for Marine Science. Um, and I've been studying coral reefs in the Bahamas for close to 30 years now. Um, but what I'd like to do in this webinar is uh, tell everybody what stony coral tissue loss disease is, give you a little bit of information about it. This is mostly information geared towards our partners working locally in the Bahamas whether you're with a conservation organization or um, many of you are with dive shops. Uh, so I'm gonna try to keep it as non-technical as possible. Um, and I see from names on the call, there are people on there that know a lot more about this disease than I do. Um, so at the end, maybe I give you guys a chance to, to talk a little bit too and address some of the questions. Um, but really want to try to make it something practical knowledge so that when you are out diving or fishing or snorkeling or whatever you're doing on the water in the water you have some idea of what to look for for this disease what to do what not to do um, when you see it so um without further ado then i'll i'll get into it uh Sorry if I'm hesitating a little bit, I just added in a bunch of new callers in. Um, in this talk, we're gonna be going over a few key things. Uh, what stony coral tissue loss disease is, why it's such a threat in the Bahamas, where we're seeing it both regionally and in the Bahamas, um, and then go over what what you should be looking for, what are some of the signs that the disease is, is there, how it's transmitted, um, and then probably most importantly, what we can do about it. Uh, so I'm gonna take a back, step back from uh, stony coral tissue loss disease and talk about coral diseases in general. Um, stony coral tissue loss disease is not the first disease to come along for corals, probably not gonna be the last. Um, right now, uh, there's at least a dozen coral diseases in the Caribbean um, that have been identified. They can be caused by various different pathogens, um, mostly microbes, uh, 
viruses, bacteria, blue-green algae, and other things. Um, they vary in how lethal they are to corals. Uh, if you look at some of the, the photos here, um, photo F, this uh, tumor-looking thing, this growth anomaly on a brain coral, is not very lethal to that coral um, in most cases. Uh, for other corals, like in the top right corner, the um, staghorn coral, and in the bottom left underneath the text box, um, the elkhorn coral there, have white band disease, which is extremely lethal. So they vary in how they affect corals. They vary in which species of corals they affect. And what we found over the past 10 years in doing several hundred, I think close to 500 surveys of corals around the Bahamas, looking specifically for disease among other things, um, about 1.5% of the corals we've seen have been infected by disease on average with the, the highest infection rate at any site prior to this year being about 15% uh, of the corals. So um, we do see corals on many, uh, infect diseases on many reefs, but it's not as big a problem for many of these diseases. Uh, it occurs at a very low rate. And some of these diseases that we are seeing don't have high mortality rates associated with them. Um, so this slide is just to show what to look for for coral diseases. And the photos on the top are of different coral diseases. Um, dark spot disease on the left, white plague disease in the middle, and um, white band disease on the right. And what to really look for at a very basic level is a discoloration of the natural coral color. Um, or areas where the coral is white and that white is actually bare coral skeleton limestone rock being exposed um, without any living tissue on top of it uh, diseases that are more uh, lethal more virulent have a rapid spread you'll have a lot more of this white bare rock exposed um, over time that bare coral skeleton will get colonized by other things, by uh, microalgae, by other seaweeds, and will uh, change color or be covered over with things. So you know it's a very virulent active disease when you see a lot of this bare white skeleton exposed. Um, now it can kind of get confusing. On the bottom are all pictures of things that are not coral disease but might look similar. Um, there are predators of corals, uh, various snails and fireworms that eat corals, and when they eat it, they'll be killing off the tissue similar to a disease does, um, and you'll see that white area exposed. That's the coral being eaten. That's not a disease. Those species may carry disease and spread it to corals, but the actual eating it doesn't necessarily mean that coral's diseased. Um, Bottom first middle picture is of a coral that has experienced partial mortality in the past, but is not actively experiencing disease now. You'll see that it's not a bright white bare limestone uh, exposed, it's being overgrown with things. So uh, we see that a lot. Uh, more than half the corals we see in the Bahamas um, have experienced partial mortality, whether it's from disease or other things in the past, and there's patches of dead parts on the active uh, on the actual coral colony itself. Um, the next picture over is one of um, pillar coral, and that one is a picture of a bleached coral. Um, you can see that it appears fuzzy. That are the polyps that are still there. That's still living coral tissue over the white skeleton. It's just that because the coral has lost it's symbiotic algae that live inside of it, uh, that you can actually see through the clear coral tissue to the limestone. That's why it appears pale like that. Um, but that coral is alive, it can recover, and that coral actually is one that we've been monitoring for 10 years, and it did recover fine from that. So um, again, not disease. Bleaching might make corals more susceptible to disease, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the coral is diseased. And then the last photo on the right is uh, a picture of um, 
fish bites on a coral, parrotfish bites, where the parrotfish has scraped away living tissue on the coral. That can heal over in many cases, and that coral will be fine. Again, not disease. So really when you're out there, you'll see all kinds of partial mortality of coral or bleaching that might appear like a disease, but really you need to, to look and see, is that coral um, have discoloring like in the dark spot disease or black band or red band disease, or is it um, have white skeleton exposed? Going into a little bit more detail on the diseases, I just put this up. This is from a paper from back in 2007 showing some of the different diseases of um, hard and soft corals in the Caribbean. And I circled the, the hard corals here, uh, showing what's causing them. And just to show that there's all different kinds of microorganisms that can cause diseases in corals, um, from bacteria to viruses, uh, cyanobacteria, fungus, algae, all can cause diseases. Um, and also to show that most of these diseases really only affect a, a few species of corals. Um, they are, some of them affect a broad spectrum of corals, some of them only a few. Understanding how diseases are affecting corals largely depends on knowing what species are in, infecting which corals, and in some cases what's causing the disease. Now, you see down at the bottom, there's question marks there. We don't know what's causing all these diseases. Sometimes it's very hard to isolate what the actual microbe is. On a healthy coral colony, there's hundreds of microbes associated with that living uh, in the coral tissue, on the mucus, and they're living there in a, in a pretty decent balance on a healthy coral. What happens is when the coral becomes stressed, whether it's temperature stress, uh, environmental stress, um, other sources of stress to that coral can cause that balance the, uh, of microbes there, the microbiome, to basically become out of whack. And it opens the door for uh, ones that cause diseases to come in. Uh, the natural coral microbiome, there are bacteria that actually produce antibiotics that kill off harmful bacteria. So uh, having uh, these microbes on a coral is not necessarily a problem. It's when specific pathogens, disease agents, uh, are allowed to uh, infect corals that um, is when we have outbreaks of diseases. So you can see on that last one, stony coral tissue loss disease wasn't mentioned at all. And that's because it simply wasn't around back then in 2007 when that uh, figure was made. Um, stony coral tissue loss disease was first discovered in, in around 2014 off of uh, Miami. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a couple minutes. Um, it appears similar to other white diseases and syndromes, white plague. And, and in fact, when it was first seen, it was thought to be uh, a especially virulent form of uh, white plague disease, I believe. Uh, th the names really aren't that important, um, but understanding uh, a little bit about how the disease spreads and how it's different uh, from the other diseases is important. Um, the other thing that I'll add right now is that the, the pathogen that causes stony coral tissue loss disease has not been identified yet. Um, there's a lot of research going on to try to see is it caused by a bacteria, and there's some evidence that I'll talk about that it is, um, but what actually is causing it uh, hasn't been determined. Um, So what does it look like? Uh, just to, to go back actually a second, uh, what I'm gonna try to do, most of these photos that I'm showing are ones that we took last month off of Grand Bahama. Um, so I'll try to just point out some of the, the features that we've been seeing. It's very similar to what's been seen elsewhere around the uh, Florida and around other parts of the Caribbean. So this is a, 
a brain coral um, in shallow waters, which were highly infected. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, this one, a pillar coral right off of Freeport as well, that's infected with stony coral tissue loss disease. Um, it really appears initially, usually at the edges of the colony and then spreads around the colony, um, spreads over it. Uh, but it sometimes does form little pockets of disease in the middle of otherwise healthy looking tissue and grows out from there. Those lesions can fuse together, forming this sort of patchwork of uh, dead coral. So um, in this picture here, the areas uh, that are kind of gray are the healthy tissue still on this uh, pillar coral. Um, the white areas are where the disease has recently killed off the coral, and the areas that are kind of little brownish in color are already starting to be colonized by microalgae and other things. Um, so getting up a little closer, what does it look like? Again, this is a symmetrical brain coral, um, Pseudodiploris trigosa. Uh, area one shows healthy coral tissue. That's what we would expect to see normally. Uh, Number two, that white band is where the coral is actively dying off. Um, and it can die off at a, a very high rate, about three centimeters per day. Um, in some lab studies, it may vary to, based on temperature and environmental conditions. Um, and then this area number three is where it has already died off and it's starting to be uh, overgrown with microalgae and other things. Uh, this is the general pattern. In this case, it probably started along the lower margin of this photo and is spreading across the, the coral head like that. Looking up even closer, um, and this isn't one of my photos, uh, but this is uh, Montastria cavernosa, another highly infected species. Uh, you can see the, the white at the top and bottom is dead coral skeleton. The greenish tint in some of the valleys, that's already the, the algae, and a lot of that might be endolithic algae that's actually living, microalgae living inside the coral skeleton itself that you can see exposed now. The brown area is the living tissue, and you can see at the edge there, it's the tissue is just kind of sloughing off. It doesn't necessarily come off one polyp at a time. It can come off in uh, chunks and patches. Um, but that's all where the active disease is killing off the, the coral colony. What's important to note though, is that even in this brown, apparently healthy tissue, uh, that can contain the pathogen as well. Probably just not as, as high uh, concentration as where it's actually killing off that uh, healthy coral tissue. Um, if we were to cut away some of that healthy brown, apparently healthy brown tissue, uh, grow it separately from the rest of the coral, that could still uh, have disease and still die off. Um, so once that coral colony is infected, um, there could be that pathogen throughout the colony. Um, so why are we so concerned with this particular coral disease? And there's really three or four reasons for that. Um, it has a very high infection rate. Uh, once infected, it has a very high mortality rate. Um, it spreads rapidly and it infects over 20 species of corals. In our surveys in Grand Bahama last month, we saw 18 different species infected. Um, the actual number might be 22, 23 about half of the coral species that we have in the Bahamas are susceptible. Um, and this uh, graphic right here is um, from one of the first papers, if not the first paper coming out to uh, talk about this uh, disease outbreak in Florida, showing the percentage of colonies at monitoring sites that were infected. And you see, <laughs> For these eight species, which are some of the more vulnerable species, and we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, it was between 70 
and 100% of the colonies infected. So um, very high infection rates, um, and like I said, very high mortality rates. Now, uh, we can all kind of relate to epidemics right now with what we're going through with, with COVID-19. Um, and I can re relate some of what we're seeing in the coral to uh, the spread of COVID-19, how we deal with strategies to prevent the spread. Um, but what I want to stress is that where this is different from a, a epidemic like what we're experiencing right now is that uh, these infection rates are off the charts. If COVID-19 was like this, we would not have a prayer. Um, and the mortality rates are extremely high too. So for corals, this is uh, extremely severe. Looking at the, the spread of it, um, again, first detected uh, by uh, Bill Precht and colleagues, and I believe Bill is on, on this webinar and uh, maybe at the end he can say a few words about it, but was, uh, seen as part of monitoring uh, regarding uh, expansion and dredging at the Port of Miami uh, back in 2014. And then it rapidly spread across the area. Um, and I'll just show, go through some quick slides showing the spread. Um, again, this is 2014, largely limited to Miami-Dade County uh, off of Miami. By 2015, it spread through Biscayne National Park up into Broward County, Fort Lauderdale area. 2016, all the way up to Palm Beach County. And all the green there is uh, in red, that's pretty much the full extent of the coral reefs in Florida along the Florida reef track. So you can see by 2016, after two years, it's probably spread to more than half of the reef area, um, less than two years actually. Uh, get my cursor back, moving on to, 2017, the whole northern part of the reef is infected, spread down to the middle keys. Uh, by 2018, down to Big Pine area. 2019, reaching close to Key West. And then just this, it's pretty much all of the Florida reef track with the exception of some of the far western areas out in Dry Tortugas. Um, and out in the western part of the Marquesas. It, and by now, to tell you the truth, it, it might have spread even since this graphic was, was created. Um, so really all the reefs in Florida pretty much, you can say, have been infected. We can also see around the Caribbean um, the spread of the disease. Uh, in 2018, it reached Jamaica, Mexico, and St. Martin. 2019, St. Thomas, DR, Turks and Caicos, it spread from Mexico down to Belize, uh, St. Eustatius, and then most recently now in 2020, we can confirm uh, it's in the Bahamas, at least in Grand Bahama. Um, and just to show a little bit more uh, about some of the reported infection rates, um, this is from Florida and Mexico. Uh, all these on the, the vertical axis are different species of corals and the prevalence, the percentage or proportion of corals infect, uh, infected with this disease at each site is shown. And you can see for some species, again, uh, well over half the corals up to 70 to 80% um, were infected. And you can see a, a broad range of different species, more than what was reported in the initial outbreak uh, being infected. Uh, so it varies a little bit from place to place, but we can see some patterns emerge, um, particularly with susceptibility or vulnerability of species to the disease. Um, and just especially for you that are going out diving, what really where to look, what to look for for early warning signs of this disease. Um, the brain corals are some of the most susceptible. Um, all these ones at the top are, are the four main uh, brain corals that we have in the Bahamas. Um, in addition to that, uh, Montastria cavernosa, the large 
uh, cup star coral, uh, pillar coral, uh, elliptical star coral, maize coral, and flower coral are all what I would consider to be sentinel species. Those are the ones that the, you're probably going to see the disease in first. Um, and those are the ones that we should really uh, be on the lookout for to see if there is disease in those. Now, those species are susceptible to other diseases too. So we might be seeing something that's not stony coral tissue loss disease killing off these corals. But if you do see these corals um, showing high signs of disease, high areas of mortality like these photos show, those are ones that should be reported. Um, and we'll talk about reporting later. Uh, but these aren't the only ones infected though. Um, we see ones that are considered, um, and this is uh, off the AGRA website, intermediate vulnerability. Um, a lot of these, these are star corals. A lot of these are major reef builders, um, especially the ones, the Orbicella ones, boulder star coral, mountainous star coral, lobe star coral, are all really some of the most important ones for creating reef framework. And they are um, at least intermediately vulnerable, um, kind of the second stage, second tier of vulnerability, uh, but other species as well. And then these are potentially lower susceptibility. Um, and I just have most of them listed here, just showing a couple lettuce coral. And then uh, I have uh, my Cetophilia here, cactus coral shown. Um, but all of these on this list, I would say some of these probably should get bumped up in terms of susceptibility, maybe my Cetophilia and some other ones, but um, these are all ones that are vulnerable to the disease, can get it. We just don't see them uh, infected as quickly or, or as um, frequently as some of the other species. Now the ones that have low susceptibility, um, are basically mustard hill coral, uh, the greenish coral in the photo on the right, um, the different species of finger coral, um, also in that photo on the right, and then elkhorn and staghorn coral. Um, and for some of us, we can breathe a, a sigh of relief that elkhorn and staghorn coral aren't susceptible to this. They uh, were nearly wiped out over the past uh, three, four decades by white band disease. Uh, in the Bahamas, particularly the staghorn coral. Um, and we're starting to bring them back uh, in our uh, coral restoration efforts, mostly targeting those two species. Uh, so they are low susceptibility, and there have been some studies showing that they um, are not, they're, they're able to be grown in reefs where that pathogen occurs, and not showing any signs of it. Uh, there's also been some limited studies showing that uh, if they are grown in those areas and are exposed to the pathogen um, and then transplanted to other reefs, they're not transmitting the infection to other reefs. Now, this is very preliminary, um, but that's positive for our restoration efforts where um, we potentially can be moving these species around from reef to reef and not worry about infecting others. Um, I would say we still need to be very cautious with that before we do that widespread to make sure that they are not transporting uh, the disease or the disease isn't in the water that we're transporting. And I'll, I'll talk about how the disease is transported in a couple minutes. Um, so the rapid spread of the disease, and this isn't uh, my photos, this is either from Florida or Virgin Islands. Um, like I said, several centimeters a day. So more than an inch a day, inch and a half a day, uh, the disease is spreading. Um, this time series here on the right shows uh, a little over a month, about 30 days, 31 days of spread of the disease from being less than 10% of the surface area of that coral to probably about 90% or more. Um, in one month killing it off. Uh, so it basically can take a coral colony, and this one looks to be about a meter or so in diameter, probably took decades to grow, um, can be killed off in a matter of weeks. There's one example of a particular coral colony in Florida, um, 
that's been aged at over 320 years old, I think, um, that over the course of a couple months died off completely from this disease. So what took decades or centuries to build can be destroyed in just a matter of weeks or months. So how does it spread? Um, there have been some studies on this done in Florida. Uh, the first way that they can spread uh, is through direct contact. Um, if a coral is touching, an infected coral is touching another coral, even one that's not the same species, it can pass that infection along and start killing off the other coral. Um, there may also be intermediate vectors involved. So uh, what we see a lot of is butterfly fish feeding on diseased coral tissue. If those butterfly fish uh, feed on a diseased coral and then go feed on a healthy coral, they potentially could be spreading the disease. We don't know that, we suspect it. That's an area where more research should be done. But what they have done, looking at both direct contact and waterborne uh, transmission, um, and looking at this figure on the right, I, uh, it's basically showing on the top ones a control where you have a healthy coral marked with an H next to another healthy coral touching it, uh, and then a, a third healthy coral fragment um, farther away in the same aquarium, in the same tank. Uh, on the bottom, you have a diseased coral touching a healthy coral and then having a third one far away. And the left and right column are just two different tests of the same experiment using different species. But what they found was that in the case of a healthy coral touching another healthy coral, the coral remains healthy. Uh, if you have one in the same tank farther away, uh, it stays healthy. What we see when you have a diseased one though is that if the corals are touching, there's a very high transmission rate of disease. And it does vary a little bit from species to species, but it can be up to 100% transmission um, of the disease from one coral to another. There's also a significant transmission of disease to the coral that's farther away, not touching. Um, it's not necessarily uh, 100%. Um, but, it, and it does vary from species to species, but it can be more than half of those corals that they showed um, could be infected. So it is a waterborne pathogen. It will spread in the water. Um, so now going to the Bahamas, uh, what we're seeing there. Um, so, Starting in July or, or August, um, divers and maybe some of you that are on this call first started noticing corals dying off of Freeport. Um, this wasn't necessarily reported to me or anyone else at the time, but after the fact and conversations that we had with uh, dive shops, um, they did say, yeah, you know, we saw something going wrong then. Um, so that was over the last summer. As we all know, beginning of September, Hurricane Dorian came through. Um, about six weeks after the storm, I led an expedition looking at what the effect of the storm was on reefs, including some off of Grand Bahama, mostly West End, um, and then uh, kind of the center of the island to the east, uh, Peterson Key National Park, Lukaya National Park, off of uh, Stad Oil. Um, not necessarily right off of Freeport, but we didn't see any instances of stony coral tissue loss disease. Um, in uh, the next month, November, um, the, our partners at Coral Vita, um, who helped with this research, start, they were monitoring corals there, and this is a timeline of theirs, the photos on the bottom. Um, they started seeing coral disease uh, and it got worse between November and January this past year. Uh, so this is uh, again Coral Vita's, coral Vita's photos. Uh, November 8th, they have an infected colony here of a brain coral. By November 27th, so 
three weeks later or so, less than three weeks later, it was already almost dead. And this is a fairly small colony. And then the photo in January shows that it's completely dead already um, and probably has been dead for a month based on the amount of growth or so on there, um, maybe more than a month. So uh, we do see that this disease, this, this, when they sent me these time series of photos, it really raised red flags and drew a lot of concern. So what we did was um, in March, we went out and did over just a, a four day period, a very quick rapid assessment of about um, 25 reefs or so off of Grand Bahama, um, doing roving diver surveys, looking to see what species and what percentage of those species were infected or recently killed off. Um, we did 18 shallow reefs, which are the extent of them is shown here in red. Um, almost all the way out to West End, over out past uh, Lucayan National Park on Grand Bahama, so covering about 40 miles of the coast. Um, and then we dove on seven deeper reefs um, between uh, Freeport and um, Lucayan National Park. <coughs> uh, what we found during that very brief assessment was qu quite disturbing, actually. Um, we found 18 different species of corals that were infected um, throughout the surveys. Uh, we looked at a few of those sentinel species in greater detail. And uh, for this first one, I'll show you, this is for the um, symmetrical brain coral. Uh, Pseudodiplorius trigosa. Uh, and this on the, the bottom axis, the horizontal axis, is just showing the spatial extent of the. Um, oops, sorry. Let me go back. Uh, showing the spatial extent of the disease. The black bars are recently dead, proportion of recently dead colonies the red bars are ones with active disease. Um, so you can see that the combined disease and death, dead corals uh, was 80 to 90% for about a quarter of the, the reefs that we, shallow reefs that we surveyed, um, or at least 75% for a quarter of the reefs that we surveyed with some upwards of 90%, 95% or so um, disease infected. What we also see is that there was a, a spatial pattern to this where on either side, reefs on either side of the port, and I'll just back up to show you, um, the port is uh, on the, the western side, uh, just to the left of Freeport, the big dark area is the port. Um, we did some reefs that were about five miles on either side of the port that had the highest mortality rates. Um, and then mortality rates decreased as we went out from there, but infection rates were very high throughout. So the disease, this is telling us a couple things. Um, the disease probably started around the port and killed off corals there before spreading out, but it has spread out more than that 40 miles uh, of coastline that we were able to survey. Um, infection rates were still 50% or, or so uh, in places where we went for this particular species. So um, the disease has spread across the southern coast of Grand Bahama to a large extent. We saw something similar on deeper reefs, looking at uh, Montastria cavernosa, different species. Um, but again, the highest mortality rates, up to 40%, were at the sites closest in around uh, the town of Freeport, closest to the port. And as we went east from there, mortality rates dropped off to, to zero. But again, infection rates were still significant throughout the area. So on the deeper reefs, it might not have been as bad as the shallow reefs. Um, for this species as it was for the other one. Uh, and that was true of most species we looked at. Deep reefs, maybe not as bad, but it had spread throughout deep, re deep reefs. And 
I think on the deep reefs, we had some reefs where nine different species at a particular site were infected. So um, deep reefs, more uh, diverse in terms of species, but greater number of species infected in general, um, although at a lower proportion. So uh, what can we derive uh, or deduce from these spatial patterns? How did the disease get to the Bahamas? Well, one hypothesis is that it came in on natural currents. And we've done a lot of modeling with a researcher at University of Miami, Dr. Claire Paris, to map out um, oceanographic patterns at a high resolution around the Bahamas. And this is just an example of three months in the summer of 2013 and what currents look like, but that's pretty much indicative of how currents are. Um, if we look and see where the disease was occurring and could it have spread to the Bahamas from there, we see, yeah, the Florida Keys, the, or the whole South Florida is very close, but it has a really strong Gulf Stream current uh, preventing it from reaching the Bahamas. So the disease, if it is in the water, from those areas is likely to have gotten swept north, probably didn't make the jump across to the Bahamas through the water currents. If we look down at the south at Turks and Caicos and Dominican Republic at the bottom uh, right corners of the figure, uh, yes, there could be spread of the disease to the Bahamas, but it probably wouldn't have jumped all the way up to Grand Bahama. And although we don't have good data from the Southern Bahamas and the disease may be there, we don't know, um, we do have a lot of reefs surveyed in the Central Bahamas and don't have any record over the past couple years of stony coral tissue loss disease, including as recently as this January. So I don't think the disease made the jump all the way up to the Northern Bahamas from down there. So another, hypothesis is it was brought there by people. Um, and the most likely culprit based on the patterns that we saw off of Grand Bahama with areas around the port having the highest disease incidence rate is through commercial shipping. And the way that that is most likely to occur is through ballast water transfer. And this was a photo taken of a ship um, in March when we were out doing our assessments, uh, sitting off the port, I don't know if it was refueling or what was going on, but there was an awful lot of water being dumped out of that ship. I don't know if that was ballast water, I don't know where that water came from, um, but all it would take would be one ship taking up water from a place like Miami or another place where the disease occurs, coming to Grand Bahama, dumping it out, and spreading the disease to there. Um, so this could be, we don't have the, the true smoking gun, but circumstantial evidence is kind of pointing to uh, this sort of transfer of the disease being how it got to the Bahamas, um, at least for Grand Bahama. Now, if we go to the Southern Bahamas and we see the disease, it might be that it's being transported there on natural currents as well. Um, so how did it spread then within the Bahamas? Well, we, we do know the currents, and if you look off the southern coast of Grand Bahama on this figure on the left, you can see there are some gyres that get set up there that pass through the, the channel. And that could be spreading in general from uh, east to west, from the port towards west end, could be spreading disease, but because those gyres, gyres circulate, um, it could also result in some spread to the east as well. So naturally occurring current patterns are potentially how things spread. Um, another thing is Hurricane Dorian. Uh, we believe that the disease was in the Freeport area prior to Dorian. Um, as Dorian came through, two things could have happened. One is a lot of the winds in that part of Grand Bahama were coming um, based on the storm circulation from west to east, so it could have transported a lot of water with that to the east. Um, in addition to water, that, uh, winds that were blowing stuff off the of land that we know stirred up a lot of sediments that created a lot of stress, potentially introducing um, 
bacteria, sediment, things from land in there and could have caused additional stress. And remember, all it takes is for some additional stresses to be on corals to help diseases spread. So transport of water to introduce the pathogen and causing stress on the corals, making them more vulnerable, might have caused the disease to spread as fast as we saw it spread in Grand Bahama. And then also, it could have spread through uh, human interactions. And I know Michael Sherratt is on this call, and I apologize for using a picture of his boat as the example here, but um, fishing boats, dive boats, pleasure boats, uh, can transfer pathogen for this disease because it is waterborne in bilge water. They can transfer it on gear, fishing gear, dive gear, whatever. Um, so it could have spread that way. Not through Michael's boat, because Michael lives in Abaco. Um, so what can we do about it then? Uh, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about what's being or what has been done, what's being done in Florida as an example. Um, because Florida has had the longest experience with it, because Florida has been the hardest hit, because uh, the reefs in Florida probably receive the most money, a lot more has been done there than other places. Um, and what some of the strategies there have focused on with varying degrees of success that I'll get into a little bit. Um, have been three things really. One is communications, just getting the word out about the disease, uh, letting people know um, about it. Uh, another one is the treatment of coral. So they've been actively going out and treating them with antibiotics in the field and in lab, and I'll talk about the success of that uh, in the next slide, I think. And then Florida has also embarked on a, a coral rescue uh, mission. Um, sort of like Noah's Ark, where they are taking healthy coral fragments from places where the disease hasn't reached yet, transporting them to aquariums throughout the U.S., and having them grown there in the thought of these are going to be the genotypes, the, the genetically distinct colonies that are then reintroduced to Florida eventually and repopulating the area. Um, so you have corals from the Florida Keys that have been shipped to New Jersey, to Mississippi, to Omaha, Nebraska, and are being grown there, uh, in addition to aquariums around Florida, um, with the hope of preserving them. It's, it's at that point where they are taking corals out of the wild, raising them in captivity, and hoping that this captive uh, maintenance, maybe breeding program, um, can actually repopulate the wild areas. Uh, so let's, let's talk about this a little bit more. Um, treatment options. Uh, again, the, the pathogen hasn't been isolated or identified. So it's not like we can say, oh, it's this particular virus or bacteria. This is what the treatment is for it and really develop a targeted treatment for it. That hasn't been possible. Um, so it's been all based on trial and error and trying to find out. And they have done a lot of experiments in the lab and in the wild using antibiotics. And it is shown that those antibiotics can uh, stop or slow the spread. Uh, this is from one lab study, the pictures I'm showing, where the NT is no treatment and the diseased part of the coral has spread over a few days. On the treated with antibiotics, it hasn't spread or hasn't spread as much. Um, so there is that possibility. And again, they're going out into the water with uh, epoxy or putty that has antibiotics in it, uh, basically excavating a little trench in coral colonies around the diseased area, putting that antibiotic in there, that antibiotic paste or putty in there, and um, hoping that that curbs the spread of the disease. Uh, it has shown to be effective at least in a percentage of the colonies, um, more for some species than others. Um, but it also raises a lot of questions about how feasible it is, how cost effective it is, are there unintended consequences of putting antibiotics in the water? Um, and then how effective is it really to prevent the spread, especially once the disease is established in an area? Um, there's also 
uh, more talk than anything, I, I believe that there may, there's probably ongoing research into looking at probiotics, introducing beneficial bacteria or microbes to corals and seeing if those will, that are characterized or characteristics of a healthy reef um, or healthy colony, if those can actually uh, prevent the disease from spreading to other colonies. So there is potentially that as a treatment option, probiotics. Um, again, there's a lot of questions about this and is it really feasible? Is it working? And I'll just add my two cents. In Florida, um, yes, they were hit first, so they got caught unawares um, and are developing all this through research from scratch. But uh, while individual colonies might be saved through this approach, it hasn't stopped the spread of the epidemic throughout the Florida reef tract um, at the scale at which they've been able to do it there. Um, and really stopping the spread, like we're learning with, with COVID-19, all of us, um, stopping the spread is the key. Uh, and there's a few things that can be done to stop the spread. Um, because it's a waterborne pathogen, it will get carried around in ocean currents from place to place. And there's really not much that we can do about that. Um, but we can potentially, through our own actions, stop the human-aided spread of it. And I think that's really the key to containing it to a single island. So things like decontaminating gear and bilge water, controlling the release of ballast water. Um, and I'll talk about both of those in a little more detail. Um, early detection and reporting. If we do detect it and report it early, we can potentially develop some, some plan around it. Um, there's also, Potentially, we can do treatment or removal options, quarantine options on an area to help prevent the spread. And then obviously, we have a lot to learn about the disease. So research and monitoring and education and awareness. Um, for uh, you all first, um, and then spreading that education on to other people as well. Um, so decontamination. What can we do about that? Uh, really what we're talking about here is boating, diving, fishing. Um, places where people are getting in the water or where boats are taking on water from a reef that may be infected and preventing that waterborne pathogen from reaching another reef that's not infected. Um, so the keys to that are decontaminating and treating. There are ways of doing that. There's a bunch of different products out there. Um, bleach and ammonia have been recommended in some cases. Uh, they do work all right. Um, they will kill waterborne pathogens. They will not work, however, on biofilm. So uh, thinking about the bilge water in the bottom of your boat, that slimy scum there that is bacteria and other microbes that create that, if the pathogen is in that, it's not necessarily gonna get killed by that bleach and ammonia. There needs to be another treatment for that. Um, the other thing is those bleach and ammonia products are harmful to your gear. Um, and if you're treating your bilge water and then pumping it out, if the, I hate to say it, but the, the cure isn't gonna be worse than the, the disease, but it could also have some unintended consequences. So, um, we're currently working and uh, people at AGRA and others are uh, coming up with other treatment options that might be less harmful to your gear, easier to do, more effective on biofilms, and you're not pumping chemicals out into the water necessarily. And it seems that there's some promise with hydrogen peroxide-based disinfectants. Um, and that's not to say necessarily go out and buy a bottle of hydrogen peroxide and use that on your gear, but there are things like um, sodium percarbonate which is actually the active ingredient in OxyClean, um, which also has other detergents in it, but um, readily available uh, laundry use primarily, um, and also cleaning use, where you can get a powder, put it in water, it creates a hydrogen peroxide solution for cleaning gear. Um, dumping some of the powder in the bilge is also possible, uh, and it's releasing hydrogen peroxide, which, um, breaks down to oxygen and water. 
Um, there's also other hydrogen peroxide base uh, products that are used in veterinary and medical practices. Rescue is one um, that might also be something suitable to use. I don't know if these things are readily available uh, in the Bahamas. I know you can buy them on Amazon. Um, so there are some things that you can use to, to treat gear. Again, preventing the spread of disease from one place to another. Um, then there's the ballast water issue, which is personally what I think introduced it to Grand Bahama in the first place. Um, there is, there are restrictions on where and when and how you can release ballast water and sediments and ballast tanks on boats. Um, the Bahamas has signed IMO convention on ballast water, which went into effect uh, in 2017. Um, I don't know all the details of that. I am not a lawyer and I tried to read through it and got so frustrated I couldn't. But basically, uh, US Coast Guard um, and other uh, recommendations are uh, minimum of 12 nautical miles away from reefs in over 200 meters of water is where the closest into shore you should be dumping ballast water. Um, 50 nautical miles is better and farther away is better basically. Uh, there needs to be uh, enforcement, there might need to be reinforced uh, legal ways of enforcing this um, within the Bahamas, but definitely stopping the spread from elsewhere, preventing it from getting from the Bahamas to other places now, and also preventing it from going from island to island in the Bahamas is really what we need to be focused on at this point. And then finally, early detection is critical. Um, this is a newly infected colony right here of uh, Deploria labyrinthiformes, a brain coral, groove brain coral. Um, if we see it early like this, we have a better chance of treating it, both early within a colony and early on a reef. So as soon as we start seeing signs of potential spread of the disease, we can develop strategies then to try to contain the spread from there. Um, there's, uh, you know, we've gone over what treatment options are. There's uh, things that we can do to, um, things that we can do to uh, prevent the spread in some way or another. Uh, what we're working on right now is developing education materials. There's a lot out there already and we want to see what's suitable to use, what needs to be modified with new information, and putting that out there to show people what to look for, and then coming up with a very simple way of reporting. There are a few websites from uh, different jurisdictions in the US and on Agra where you can already report uh, seeing uh, the disease. Those are more geared towards uh, a, a people with a scientific background doing a survey. Um, what we want to do is come up with a very simple way for the layperson to report things. Send a photo uh, or a description of what you've seen. Send a location. If you have GPS coordinates, great. Otherwise, again, a description of where you saw it. And then contact information so we can follow up. With those three pieces of information, we're hoping to uh, be able to follow up and verify if the disease is there or not and see what we need to do about it. Um, at the end of the presentation, since we don't have this web-based reporting system online yet, I have a couple email addresses that you're welcome to send stuff to um, if you do have uh, some concerns about potential spread in some of the areas where you are working. Um, so what's the response then once we see it? Well, I wanna stress that the government right now is working with, um, myself and other scientists to develop a strategy. Um, we've been on fairly uh, regular calls um, for the past month or two months with Best Commission, with uh, Department of Marine Resources, with the Grand Bahama Port Authority and Bahamas National Trust as a starting point to discuss the disease um, 
there's been recommendations sent to uh, relevant ministers to establish a task force to develop the strategies that we'll be um, working on. So I'm not going to be advocating or saying there is an official strategy or response that we're going to have. Um, that is something that will be developed. But we have seen in other places that there's been uh, different options used. Um, quarantining in areas to prevent the spread from one area to another, so not allowing boats to go there potentially. Uh, we've seen in Florida the use of antibiotics, the potential use of probiotics, and then something that has come up and might be a solution is removal of coral, um, either culling a whole colony if it's infected or uh, amputating basically the part of the colony that is potentially infected in hopes of preventing the spread to other colonies. Um, this is something that we need to develop criteria as to which one of these options or a new option get used under certain circumstances. But if we do catch it early enough, um, just like with the spread of COVID-19, if we can isolate one or two individuals first, um, and remove them from the rest of the population, in the case of coral, unfortunately, it might mean killing them, uh, we can prevent the spread to others. So um, we do have uh, a couple tools that we're able to use if we catch the disease early. And I can't stress that enough, is that that early detection is the most important thing. Um, just to wrap up, uh, there's a lot of resources out there. Um, I put up a couple websites where I've gotten a lot of material for, for this webinar. Um, the uh, Florida Department of Environmental Protection, Florida um, Fish and Wildlife all have information up on their website. NOAA does as well. Um, FloridaKeys.noaa.gov. Uh, ReefResilience.org and the AGRA website also have a lot of um, material that they've collected from others uh, with educational materials, things like that, um, that provide more information. So I would encourage anyone interested in, in learning more to go to some of these websites. We will be developing more content on our website um, and hopefully a reporting mechanism uh, over the next couple weeks moving forward. Um, but in the meantime, if you do, uh, have anything to report or have any questions, um, these are some email addresses that you can use.